All right. Okay. Now. So. Okay. So we want to go to lecture seven and then I'd like you to. So we've done intro, we've done business ethics and employees. We've done uh, business ethics consumers. And then we've also done uh, business ethics suppliers and then we've also done competitors suppliers and competitors now we've also done government and then we've done in a lecture in a lecture hello so we've also done civil society. So I'd like you to know where we began from. So today we're doing descriptive model for ethical decision. Now, if this title sounds complicated to you, I'll do it in a plain English. And it's like this. It's about why do people right, commit ethical things? So this is what it is. Why do people commit ethical offense? Why do people commit ethical offense? Why do people commit ethical offense? So um, we're going to look at some of the reasons why people make ethical mistakes. Now, for us to do that, there's a framework that we will discuss. And this is, this is so if you are taking notes, the title is uh, descriptive model for ethical decision. And the meaning of that is that we want to learn how people commit ethical offense or we want to learn why people make ethical mistakes. Now, there is some figure in the slides. And I'm going to explain it to you. Now, the figure says that eh, people who commit ethical mistake, they go through a series of thinking pattern. And the thinking pattern has four stages. Number one, recognize moral issue. Number two, make moral judgment. Number three, establish moral intent. Number four, engage in moral uh behavior so if if it is about if it's in the exam and i ask you the, the figure is about thinking pattern thought processes that people go through people who commit ethical mistakes now the processes are one recognizing moral issues Recognizing moral issues means that everybody who has stolen, who has been in prison before, who has been convicted in a court, such a person, what made the person to be convicted was that the person encountered an incident, a situation, and then contemplating on it. Must I get involved? Must I not get involved? So now an, a good example of that is that, for example, you enter into a classroom at Wisconsin and nobody was there and you saw a laptop. Somebody forgot or left his or her laptop. 
So immediately you chance on that two things are happening. You can decide maybe three things, not to touch it, leave it. You can decide to pick it and send it to the administration for them to look for the owner. Or you can decide to build away with it. And the reason why you're likely to do that is that there's nobody there. There's no camera there. So if you're not a moral person, why would he want you to go, go along with it? So recognizing moral behavior means that people chance on uh, situations that it's not the best for them to behave like that. But because nobody is around, right? They're contemplating and say, if I do this, what is going to happen? Man, there's nobody here. So why don't I do this one? So if you saw somebody has left their money, if you saw somebody has left their laptop, if you work in the bank and there's a lot of money at your disposal and you can put 100 Ghana in your pocket because tomorrow when you come, you come and put it in, those things that present temptations, they are the things we refer to as recognition of moral issue. So for example, if you're working with a junior person, because you're the senior person, you can bully the junior person. You have opportunity to do that. Even though it's not wrong, but you're tempted to do that. So because you can bully the person, you can cheat on the person because you're the stronger party. Business ethics is saying that that situation brings a moral issue. That's number one. Now, when you encounter such a situation and you're asking the question, is it good if I do? Is it not good if I don't do? We call those things moral judgment. So everybody who has been converted in a law court before, what made them to go to the court for them to be convicted is that they encountered a moral problem. They couldn't control themselves. They did the otherwise and the law got on them. Okay, so they said, is it good? Is it not good? Then eventually they did it the other way and they were caught. So that is about moral, moral judgment. So everybody who has done the wrong thing knew that this wrong thing, it wasn't good for them to do, but they couldn't control themselves and they did it. We call that one moral judgment. Now, the third stage is about moral intent. Moral intent simply means that if I decided to do, what is going to be the implications? So people do certain things simply because they know that they wouldn't be caught. If they were, if they were certain, they were going to be caught, man, they wouldn't have done what they did. But in, in several cases, they thought they're not going to be caught. They're not going to be caught. So the implications of if you're caught, we call that one moral intent, I think, right? Implications of that. Now, I met moral issues. I saw somebody's laptop. Um, it's good if, if I don't pick it, but there's nobody there, I'm going to pick it. Is it bad? Yes, it is, but nobody will see me. All right? Maybe I will say, oh, I mean, even if later on the person remembers that he or she has left his or her laptop over there because he's been, he's acted careless. I think that the person deserves the punishment. So when these things go through my mind, eventually I'm, if I'm not able to control myself, I'm gonna engage in unethical behavior by taking or stealing, bolting away with the laptop. Or maybe if I'm an accountant, I'm going to embezzle money. I'm going to do a number of things. Okay, so that's, that is the thought processes. That, so people don't begin to be, misbehave. No, 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 no. They'll be thinking. Things will go through their mind. They will say, go back again. Do A, do B, and so on and so forth. Okay, so stage one is about why people commit ethical mistakes. And the answer is that they go through some degree of thought pattern, recognizing moral issue, 
making moral judgment, the implication of that judgment, and eventually they will decide to do one thing or the other, which is engaging in moral behavior. Uh, then we will move on to another. Okay, very good. So you can read the slides I have skipped. They are all the things I have explained, but another important figure which I need to share light on is this one. Now you see that in this figure, we, we are seeing the processes I touched on in the previous slide. Recognizing moral issue, make moral judgment, establish moral intent, engage in moral behavior. We've made it again. And then the question you're asking me, sir, why are you introducing it again? Now, we're introducing it again because the explanation here uh, requires the processes. Now, this figure, if I give it to you in the exam and I say explain, this is how you will explain it. You will say the thought processes that people go through to commit ethical breach, to commit ethical offense, to make ethical mistake is that some of the things that make them to do the mistake is because of their personality characteristics. That is why you're seeing personalities past factors there. Okay, so you will say that they, now why people, that the thought process, the thought patterns that they go through, the, it is influenced by, in other words, look, the, the decision in quadrant one or stage one or box one, decision that they will make in box two, decision that they will make in box three, decision that they will make in box four. Now, this figure is trying to say, it is decided also in part based on the personality characteristics of factors. Who know, who see those characteristics in the moment. And then the, 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 the bottom, the beneath, there's a concept there and it says situational factors. You will also explain in the exam that the decisions in each of the stages, even though it is influenced by personality characteristics, which we will see in a moment. However, it is also influenced by certain situational factors, which we will also see in a moment. Okay, so we'll go back, we'll, we'll continue, and then we'll come to, so Ms. Letra, what personality characteristics influence people to go through those thought patterns, number one, age and gender. So they say, now people who are mature and aged, the more experienced in their cautious compared to junior and young people, junior and young people. I mean, in, I've lived in certain countries and uh, my experience is that, um, I mean, this is Europe. There's a lot of, I mean, if you see white, I think that the most Western countries, white old ladies and old men, they are kind, very kind than the young and the middle people. Okay. So more junior, senior, senior people are calm, they are kind, they are sober. That is, that is what it is. And then they say, compared to men, women are calm, they are honest, yeah, the more focused, concentrated than men. So for example, when it comes to stealing, you're gonna have more men stealing compared to, sorry, yeah, women, that's what it is. So there's a lot of the financial institution, they prefer working with women to men. If you go to the prisons, you're gonna find a lot of men compared to women. So it means that committing 
ethical offense, to committing ethical breaches, no doubt it is based on uh, age and gender. Then it, another personality characteristic is where you're coming from. See, in Europe and North America, because the law is very pronounced and strong, people are afraid of cameras. I mean, the least mistake, you go to prison. So people are more honest in USA, especially North America, Canada, especially most, more than most part of the world because of their culture. In the, in the global South, in Africa, and a lot of, a lot of the third world countries, people are not honest. People are not sincere. People do not, they do not tell the truth in most cases. So there's a friend of mine, he works with a firm here in Ghana, and the owners are from the Netherlands. He, he tells me that the, the owners of the firm, they're policing them. They're policing them when they go for break. They're watching how long they're going to spend during the break. And I told the gentleman that the guys are doing that simply because they do not trust you people. So you people have lost credibility. Can you imagine? So where you're coming from, and then your education background is also very important. There are certain things an educated people will not do. For example, I'm robbery. I'm not talking about corporate embezzlement or corporate stealing. For example, Boggling. You're going to get more people who are dropped out of school doing that. I can I can see this of a certainty. All the armed robbery in Ghana, they're perpetrated by illiterate people, people who did not go to school. Nobody will go to school and go do armed robbery. The worst they will do is that they will steal at the company, not just roaming in the street, waking up 2 a.m. with the van, I'm van and going to the city center and robbing people. So the, the more you're educated men, the more you're presentable and you're honorable. The more you're presentable and you're honorable. There's a lot of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them. So personal values. I'm a pastor. Okay, I'm a, I'm a lecturer at the University of Ghana, but I'm also a pastor in Ghana here. So I have, apart from my professional ethics and standards, I also have certain values, the certain things I will not do. So all those things are part of it. And then number five is orientation to locus of control. Locus of control refers to people who commit ethical breaches and they will level blame on people. They will say, oh, the government did not pro provide as this. So why don't I also do this? My company is not paying me over time. So me too, if I get a man, I'm going to do things that is going to be against them. We call those one external locus of control. But if you are self-control and you take responsibility and they say you're very good and you have internal locus of control. So these are the um, individual characteristics. So if we go back, if I give this to you in the app, you have to tell me that now when I when people see issues and they will say this is bad, this is not bad, the type of moral judgment they will, they will make, the type of moral intent they will do, and whether or not they will engage in moral behavior, tell me that it will depend on their age, it will depend on their character, I mean, their, their gender, their education. And you know, it is, they, they do not go for one point all of them will go for each of the stages. Stage one, my age, my gender, my nationality. Stage two, my age, my gender, my nationality, and so on and so forth. Now, we go to stage number, uh, the, uh, what? The, 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 see, let's go back. You know, I told you that um, apart from individual factors, there are also situational factors. And you will say, what are you talking about? Look, so also i like you to know that the situational factors consist of two things. 
what are the two things? One of them is the issue. If I say issue, I will also write here and say slash object. Issue slash object. Okay, and then contest. I will write here, please. And I'm gonna explain. So this is what it takes. It says that whether people will commit ethical mistakes, listen to this. It depends on the object of that ethical problem. What I mean by object is like this. If somebody went to the classroom, you know, I was giving laptop example, but a good comparison will be, if anybody went to the classroom and never saw laptop and they saw um, a pen, man, they're not gonna give a damn. They will say, man, what is pen to hell with you? Even if it's a brand new pen, they will, they will be careless. They will be indifferent whether they are to steal or not. But if it is not about pen and it's laptop, there will be temptation to say, mass I take, mass and I take. It therefore means that what makes people to misbehave ethically depends on the attractiveness of the object. So we need to be very careful. That is what it means. That's number one, the object. So people have gone to prison because they thought that they were getting money to go and build house or buy nice cars. You know, I've, I'm a Ghanaian and I finished my formative education here in Ghana. As I'm speaking to you right now, one of my formative schoolmates is in prison, right? In my year group, we're thinking about visiting him and then, you know, dashing him some money. What made him to go to prison? He stole big money, government money. Can you imagine? It's bad. Meanwhile, he has wife and children. So why do you complicate your life like that? You bring people into the world. They're depending on you and you mess their life. So your children, I'm not sure what is going to happen to them. How are they going to survive? So if care is not taken, they will end up to become armed robbers themselves. Because life is going to be tough for them. If the dad is in prison. He's going to take good care of them. Especially if they are girls. It's crazy. Can you imagine? You know? So that's the problem with my friend. And my friend meddled in that situation simply because he thought that, man, this is attractive. So don't forget that what makes people to misbehave unethically is about the object. If the object is attractive, man, they are tempted. Can you imagine? The second thing is not the object. You see that the place, the place where the object is. And I'm going to explain. For example, now, if you're working with U.S. Embassy here in Ghana, United States Embassy, I've been there before not going for a visa. I've renewed my visa a couple of times, but going there on the meeting. And there's a lot of cameras, a lot of them. So in American embassy, they have canteens, they're a nice place. See, in American embassy, even if somebody leaves their money at the, at the canteen, you dare not pick it because the camera will get you which means that the, the way the place is designed is helping people to behave ethically because otherwise they will be caught. But when I came to Wisconsin and I saw a wallet and I saw a laptop, man, if I'm not a good person, I will misbehave. Why? Who will see me? No camera, nothing. Therefore, so two things are happening. Whilst the attractiveness of the object can tempt people, where the object is located can also be more tempting. That is all about all the things we are discussing. So this lecture is trying to say, if you're a manager and you're working and, and then you are the thing that you're committing to people is more sensitive take their age into consideration, take their agenda into consideration, 
take their values into consideration. Otherwise, they're going to be misbehaved. You know, um, in my workplace, the government gives me one national service person to work for me every year free. And this year, I have decided not to work with the young men. I've decided to work with the young girls. Because a lot of the young men, when we appoint them, they don't show up on time. But the ladies that we brought, if it said, you tell them the men, come on, half past each. Sometimes 8 p.m., sorry, 8 a.m., they're, they're here. Every time I come, I go to the common room, they are there. So I have resolved not to hire the young people, the young boys. I mean, this is now, again, depending on what I do. There are other things, yes, I will look for the boys, but in the light of what I do, I'll go for the girls. So what we are learning is very important for practicing managers. And it's also trying to say, or it's saying again that when object is very attractive, you need to protect it. Listen to this. If, if an object, money, what have you, is very attractive, you get it. But apart from protecting it, the location and the environment very important. Okay. And this may be, I'm very careful where she goes. I'm very, very careful where she goes. And I'm thinking about many, many, many things in my mind every day. Okay, so in the same way, how your firm is designed, how your company is designed, how the office is designed, can also be a potential opportunity for people to commit ethical offense. The last thing we want to learn is that uh, there are certain things. Okay, you can read all this. Yeah. Okay, so I will write here um, on uh, ethical rationalization tactics. So this is also saying. We don't expect anybody who has come to do master degree calls himself or herself a professional person to say all the things I'm going to walk you through. One of them is called denial of responsibility. Second one, denial of injury, denial of victim, social waiting, appeal to higher loyalty, metaphor for ledger. If in the exam, if I say write short notes on this, what are you going to say? And what you're going to say is in the column three, the last column where I've titled it examples. It says, if I tell you that there's something in, in, in ethics which is called denial of responsibility, yeah, and I say explain, you will say, when people commit ethical offense, and then they say, oh, what can I do? All right? Okay, or, or if they say, it is none of my business, what the corporation does in overseas is bribery. So in other words, there is robbing Peter to pay Paul. They're giving tech for tight. You do A and I do B against you. And that is ethically unacceptable. So somebody's trying to say, I did that because you, you're doing Western. So don't, don't, don't engage in that. Don't do that as a person. Second one is denial of injury. What does that mean in the exam? You will say people can do et ethical offense and they will say no one was really harmed. Or they will say, oh, but why, why are you crying? I thought this one is small. Don't worry. Okay. So they will say, oh, don't, this is not a problem. Man, it could have been worse. No, 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 no. You have to empathize with the person. Tell one denial of victim. What does it mean? People can commit ethical offense and they say, oh, don't mind them. They deserve it. They deserve it. They themselves, they chose to participate in that. I don't expect anybody to do that. Third one, social waiting. No, no. Yeah, social waiting. What does that mean? 
people commit ethical offense, they will say, you have no right to criticize me, okay? Because you do worse than what I've done. Please don't do that. Appeal to higher loyalties. People commit ethical offense, and they will say, we answer to more important cause. I will not report it because of my loyalty to my boss. This is conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. Yeah. Conflict of interest. The last one, metaphor for ledger. It is all right for me to use the internet for personal reason I work. After all, I do over time and they do not pay me. It's a lot of them. So please, when you become a, a master's degree holder, you are respected. And we're not teaching you just for exam and you know, writing exam. Man, you gotta be you gotta behave. Okay. You gotta behave. <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> very, very important. All right. So that is all about why do people commit ethical mistakes, they run through thought process, fall of them. This is dependent whether they will you know, do the untoward or they will decide negatively. It's influenced by a host of personality characteristics. It also depends on the object in question. It also depends on where the object is located. That's all. Okay, anybody has any question? Okay, so we will, uh, I will discuss another, um, I will discuss another lecture and then I will walk you through the, uh, the, um, what do you call it? The assignment I want you to write, and I'd like you to study the assignment right away. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, I'll try and see your face in the school so that if I see you in town, in the airport, anywhere in the world, we can greet one another. So. I'm going to see you. A few of them we've met before, but some of you have not met you. So I'm going to see you. Yeah. Um, if you're a church person, like I said, I'm a pastor. Um, you, can, you can also visit me on Sunday. It doesn't mean you're not you're stopping your church, no, but you can come visit my church. I'm going to receive you nicely. But otherwise, I'll come to Wisconsin to say hello. I'll come and teach one of the teachers. I'll come physical. Okay, now, is are you seeing the number eight? Yes, please. Now, number eight yes, is sir. very interesting. Very, very interesting. And this is what it, it says. So it says, look, implementing business ethics, part one. It, what it says is that all the things I have discussed with you, I mean, those of you who have paid attention, you know that it's interesting. We need them. But how do we practice this at the place of work? That is the concentration of this lecture. How do we get ethics at the place of work? And the, this lecture would not be completed if I don't teach you how that can be done. And then, so we move on and we ask, we answer the how. And the how is that, look, for business ethics to be practiced at our place of work, we need to all the things that we are interested to uphold them as ethical principle, all right, at that place of work, we have to, collect all of them, put them in a report called Code of Ethics. That is what we are discussing. So, Luko, 
Now, you see, business ethics implementation and management are the direct attempt to formally or informally manage ethical issues, problem through specific policy practices program in a document called Code of Ethics. Then they say, what are the Code of Ethics? It consists of a series of look statements setting out organizations' values, not laws, values, explaining how it sees its responsibilities toward stakeholders in the areas of ethical issues. Okay? Areas of ethical issues. It goes on to say, code of ethics are explicit outlines of type of conduct. I like that one. That is desired and expected of employee and other stakeholders. Man, I'm going to underline that. So we'll go for this one. Remember during lecture one, I said it is not laws. They are simply rights of stakeholders that are not written law. We uphold it. Perfect definition are uh, explicit, simply refers to behavior, which is desired and expected of employees and other stakeholders within certain organization, profession. Man, wonderful, 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 wonderful. Now, if you come to my university here, we have a lot of course, sexual harassment, bullying, plenty, a lot of them, a lot of them, a lot of them, okay? A lot of them. Now, so that is what you have to know. So please, uh, I mean, I will be surprised if you are just listening and you're not writing and reflecting. So this is a practical aspect of the course. How do we go back to the workplace to Make sure that this is working. We have to put everything we are interested in in a document called Code of Ethics. Okay? Then you don't need to forget that. And then, um, look. Okay, so now the next thing you need to know is that when we say Code of Ethics, there are several types. I can also ask you in the exam, list the types. We have organizational level one. Uh, a moment. Hello, Dickens. Yes, sir. How are you? Uh, I'm in the meeting, so I'll call you. Eh? But when I finish. Uh, uh, right. So the, the, the course are a lot. We have organizational code professional code, industry code, group code. Now, what is organizational code? Organizational code, um, organizational code is like my, my company here, those that we have here, we call this one organizational code. Now, if I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a chartered account in my profession. Those ones are called professional code. Then in, in Ghana, a lot of firms, so all the advertising companies, they have one group they belong to. We call it the advertising something we call association of industry. So different, different, different industries will converge and then they will have a code, different type. But you know, in this lecture, we will limit our discussion to organizational level and professional level only. So today I'm gonna run you through the organizational level, okay, the organizational level. Now, now, so if I were you, I will print that down. I'm doing organizational level. And the organizational level, I'm gonna walk you through four stages. 
So this is A. And look, oh. second one is B. Third one is C. Fourth one is D. Okay. Now, this code like the code at University of Ghana. If I say dimension, what I mean is mass. Since that is interested, I will ask you this. The first section of every organizational code mass consists of only the things that the company or the institution concern is interested to uphold, promote. So look at what I've done here. And look, those ones, we call them code of ethics, not conduct. Not behavior, not practice. So there is a difference between different between code of ethics and code of practice. The practice mean, but all the things that the address in these areas are the things I'm going to uphold from ethical point of view, then these things become the code of not conduct, not become the ethics or the principle. Now, look, if we go on, look at the number three, another firm can see me, I'm concerned about information privacy of my work. I'm concerned about electronic and data privacy. I'm concerned about psychological privacy. I'm concerned about social harassment. I'm concerned about if they say these are the things they want to uphold these things are they not practice, they not behavior, but they are what they are. Expect every organization be talking about things that they intend to have down. It constitutes bullying. Then this practices behavior are what we call code of conduct, code of practice code of behavior what you're saying in principle is that when you indicate that you're concerned about bullying at the ethical level you when behavior you will never Compromise. Uh, you at people it's cool the shouting because because you not have cool with that corresponding be colleague in the house to if I see into somebody this is the present and prescribe correspond sanction fraction. It means that I have moved from the ethical principle to the conduct and to the correspondence. In other ways, if I also have ethical conduct behavior without corresponding sanctions, man, I'm falling short of what is best practice as far as good of practice and conduct are concerned. And the last one is that when I have the principle, when I explain the conduct, when I have the sanctions, I should also have opportunity for hearing. In other ways, 
if somebody is charged to committing ethical offense, the person should come and say, man, you're charging me wrongfully. So I want to come to defend myself. So if you come to my university, we have got tribunals here. You can meet committee and explain your part of the issue. And we can be allowed to go free. Okay. All right. So you a case review organizational level code of ethics. What you're going to do is that you will pick the first thing and, and ask whether it is there. You go ahead and say, okay, now that I see the principle, did they go ahead and add the corresponding conduct? If it's not there, you write. And you say, okay, yes, but I see the conduct, but I'm not seeing punishment or sanction. Oh, okay. And the last one, I never saw redress, opportunity for hearing. Redress. That's all that you need to do. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to send you assignment today, 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 today. And this is how, how Okay. All right. Please, are you able to see my um, what I'm sh shooting on the screen? Yep. I mean, for all. Um, so I will be not. What Eunice? I think you, Eunice, you were you, you were recording. Oh, is 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 Eunice gone? Please, Eunice, is he gone? Yes, sir. Oh, so when would that inform? Eunice is online. I say. Eunice. Yes, sir. Please, I was saying that my connection is coming on and going off, so it's better for Joel to. Oh. Then I, I, it means that there's a lot of parts has just gone. Is that, is that yes, sir. Uh, 